Hi there, Stan. What up, brother? Man. Stan, the, the, the greatest of cheers and good wishes to you as a human being and as a professional and as the founder and uh, principal. And best of, friends. Of Proco and best friends. Yes. And every, just everything, everything. Just, yeah. Thank you, kind You're sir. Oh, okay. Maybe we should roll the intro now that we got that out of the way. Yeah. Welcome back to the podcast, Marshall. I have returned from beyond the veil to discuss a matter of vast intelligence. Not the pathetic intelligence that your meat machine can produce, but a different sort of intelligence. Intelligence of the artificial variety. That's right, Marshall. We're revisiting the most unpopular topic of this podcast. There is no escape, Marshall. Embrace your fate. What? What was the last one? Embrace your fate. Oh. It did not sound like that. No, I thought I thought he said, unbrace your fight. Embrace your fight. Prepare I, to fight. Marshall. When did you record that? I did not. Tell me more. Whoa. The anticipation. <laughs> oh, man. That was AI. That was AI. And those artificial intelligence. What do you do? Well, em embrace... You know, embrace your fight. Embrace your fight. Yeah. That's what you do. <laughs> embrace your fight. <laughs> Marshall. Yes, Stan. I wish we had your voice. Well, maybe someday. <laughs> yeah. We didn't get permission from Marshall. <laughs> which means we have to just use a different tool. Yeah. Where we don't have to get written consent. Ooh. Ooh, snaps. Ooh. Ooh. We're going to talk about legal implications of all this. We're Probably, about yeah. Ethical implications. We're going to talk about opportunities, creativity, oh. what's going to happen in the future, the way the world's going to end. Yeah, this is going to be a three-hour special. Oh, okay. People will love Way it the way they down. love the other ones. You know what? We were way too... We, we, we were. <laughs> we were you way were. too early. You were ahead of the time. Nobody cared. Nobody because cared. Because their job wasn't on the line yet. Everybody cares now. Yeah. No, not everybody. Well, some no, people no. aren't paying attention. Oh yeah, but that was Descript. It's not even an AI app. This this is just a podcasting app that you can edit your podcasts. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's used for a lot of things, but I think the main thing is like you you can podcast. You record your voice. It transcribes it for you, and then you edit your podcast. You can edit with the text. With the text, you don't even have to have a video or audio editor. You just like delete the words or you move them around. And it changes the audio for you. It just moves the audio clips around. But they recently added the AI voice so that if you want to actually change the words that you say, you can change it and it sounds like, it sounds real. Christian told me about the, the podcast app, but the problem I have with it is that you put in that text and it reads it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't it's have any perfect. emotion that's making the inflections. Marshall, you sound like everybody else three I know. years ago. I, it, it, oh, it yeah, yeah, does. Yeah. It's but, not good right now. But it will. Of course. Of course it will. But, you know, it's. I guess the reason I said that is not that I'm negating what the future is. It's just that I wouldn't want to do it right now. Well, because you, you want to wait till it's all perfect for you. Yeah. Be a, so you're not be, a late you're, adapter. No. You but a, a, a... Not an early adapter. No, definitely on not an early adapter. adapter. On time adapter. Well... This is a good question. How do you define on time for adopting a new thing? Oh, by the curve. Hardly anybody's using it. And then when it rises, I'm usually on it right at about the time that it's it's taking off. You like to crest that wave? Yeah. <laughs> but that's now. It means less trouble. That's now. But I'm going to wait. It's right uh, when it's taking off. I'm going to wait. Also, I don't have any real use for it right now. Okay. That, at least not that I know. I mean, that is definitely a prerequisite. You need to be interested to use it in, yeah. in the first place. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's going on with you, Stan? I recently launched the Drawing Basics course. Huh? Yeah. This is the Drawing Basics course for beginners at drawing so that they will be ushered into this discipline well. Yeah. It's kind of weird I've never made a course for beginners. You've been planning it for a long time, it's though, It's supposed right? to be, you know, like the drawing resource for people trying to learn how to draw. And like, you, I, I'm starting them off with figure drawing. <laughs> you have to Which get was not street cred first. Yeah, that's true. Well, you got the street cred. Yeah. So this is for absolute beginners who are just starting out. This is the very first class you could take and you won't be intimidating. You're not going to be, you know, drawing people. Mm -hmm. Characters. We're going to draw humanoid characters, but we're not going to try to, you know, shave realistic. We're going to venture into that a little bit, introduce yeah. that kind of thing. But I want this to be a course that people take two times. 
you get a double whammy. Yeah. So oh. every project that I give, and this is a very project heavy course, mm -hmm. is going to have two v skill levels. The first one is level one, which is for the absolute beginner. This is the first time you're taking it. You do the, the easy one. And then if you're kind of an intermediate person um, who has been drawing for a little bit, but you're trying to fine tune your fundamentals, I'll give you a more challenging one so that, you know, we're practicing shape design. You could practice it on a more challenging subject. So it's the same course with different levels of yeah. challenge. Because I'm teaching fundamental skills that apply no matter what skill level, what, what profession you're in, these same fundamentals apply throughout everything. So you could practice, you should be practicing all these fundamentals throughout your entire career. That's good thinking. Yeah. Is that something you came up with recently or did you have that in? Kind of, yeah. I've never heard you say that before and that sounds good. This was uh, this was this year within this year that I added that to the course. Yeah, so you can revisit it without being bored. The reason is cuz I know that there's a lot of people that are dancing around the intermediate areas mm -hmm. of drawing and the things that are holding them back are uh missing, you know, holes in their fundamentals. Mhm. Mm and they will not want to take a beginner course because mm -hmm. it kind of challenges their ego. And so I want to make, try to encourage them to take a basics course like this because fundamentals, if you have holes in those, that's going to keep you from getting to that master level. So, that sounds yeah. good. It sounds like uh, there, there's even an advantage for doing this later rather than 10 years ago because you know more and you're also aware that this is a that need. That is true. Yeah. I'm that impressed with what you've shown me uh, in, in the outline. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So it's on um, pre-sale now. We'll start it in January. Okay. Cool. It's drawing, uh, perk.com slash drawing. Perk.com slash drawing. Perk.com slash drawing. Can you, can you make the AI say it? Proco.com slash drawing. No, the whole pitch that I just did. <laughs> See who did it better. Proco dash? Proco, but I said it like four <laughs> times. Proco.com Proco. slash drawing. Yeah, I was sort of Proco dash. Perk.com slash drawing. Perk.com slash drawing. Perk.com slash drawing. Perk.com slash drawing. Drawing lessons from the great master Heinrich Klei, taught by me, Saturdays in January 2023. Go to martialart.com. Okay, well, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, this basics course that you're doing is to teach people how to draw by yeah. hand so that they can sit down and imagine something and draw it or observe something and add some interpretation to it. It's a human activity, this drawing thing that goes way back before technology. What's the point <laughs> in a world where artificial intelligence has been introduced? And, and what's the point of drawing when the machines can do it so well? Here's how I think about it. I don't have a an answer for everybody. Everyone's going to have a different reason for drawing. But the way I look at it is that drawing is a visual language. It's a form of communication. And just because a robot can speak doesn't mean we should stop speaking. Good okay? statement. Yeah, because you want to communicate with somebody next to you or with people across the country or the world, whatever. You want to say something with a picture. And being fluent in the visual language is very helpful. It can be. Sometimes it's more powerful. Your message is more powerful when it's said visually mm -hmm. than with words or with, you know, with speech or with text. If you create an image, you can say that exact thing that you're trying to say. Now, I know some people are think, well, well, you can just write that in the prompt and the AI will make that image for you, but not necessarily. I mean, not yet at least. And it might be a long time until you can say and get that exact thing that you're visualizing. But right now, in order to get the picture you're visualizing, you have to, well, first of all, it's impossible because it's got its own mind. Mm -hmm. But to get even something really close, you have to spend like 30 minutes trying out all these different prompts. Mm -hmm. And eventually you're like, okay, yeah, that's kind of close. Uh, but how do I change it to change this one thing? By the time you've gotten the thing that you want, it would have been better for you to just draw your thing. Mm -hmm. Depends on how complex your picture is. 
Yeah, the intent is very important. Like if you're trying to create an illustration for your novel that has got a very specific character, they have to have a very specific expression on their face. They have to be holding something very specific, a costume, and there's a specific background, you know, very specific things that are related to your story. You, cur you can't currently use the tools to make that exact picture. It will happen. I don't have a clear picture of why or how, but I just, I feel like speaking is still worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's, let's grant that and then say, yeah, but I want to make a living as a professional artist. How will I ever compete with AI? Compete for a job? For Compete for making a living, for money that people are going to pay me when AI can just, it, it's like, a, it's John Henry and the machine. It's yeah. the, how are you going to compete with the machine? Unfortunately, I, th I think some jobs will just go away. Like, this isn't all, like, happy, mm -hmm. like, good news for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is bad news for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Can you be more specific? Like, companies will just not hire an artist to do a certain specific job when an AI could do it cheaper and faster. Yeah, like, why? What, is, what would be a reason why a company would hire an artist? If an AI will do it cheaper and faster. Because companies are filled with good hearted no. people who want to. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is no reason. Yeah. The, the, the only potential reason is quality could mm -hmm. be higher. Mm -hmm. with, well, there's, well, actually there's more reasons. One is brand. brand just well, because it's that artist. That because it's it. that artist and this artist really did it. Yes. The artist but really for did. most commercial purposes. Yes, exactly. Most commercial purposes doesn't matter. It doesn't make it. In fact, it is the people who have uh, the, the most recognizable image branding that can be the most easily ripped off because their stuff is a specific style that AI can say, I get that style and mm -hmm. it can run with it. Uh, and, and even right now, there are several concept artists who it's, are, are filling the, is it the database or the, the reference base? What do they call it? Where the information comes from? Training data. The about. training data. Training data yeah. Do you know who Dave McKean is? No. He's a, an a British illustrator okay, no, and, no. and create, he's, he's a designer and, and writer and all sorts of things. But he was one of that wave of what people called the British invasion of the 1980s in, in, mm. uh, in graphic novels and, and lots of other things. He was worked with Neil Gaiman and, and he was part of, oh, okay. he's part of that group of Alan Moore and Grant Morrison and all them. He did the same man covers, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Dave McKean is, was a, oh. is a versatile, remarkable illustrator. He did, they did a two and a half hour interview with him just a month or two ago that is worth the two and a half hours. I'd say an, an hour plus of the content is relevant to anyone who cares about this. He has extremely ambivalent feelings about AI to the point of where he, he's, he just illustrated a graphic novel with it. He thinks it's amazing, but he also says that he's... He's fearful that it is, uh, it, it needs to be uninvented and that uh, it's a bit like when you introduce a virus bomb into a computer or a system of computers to see what happens, to see how vulnerable they are. But this is, he thinks, like introducing a virus bomb into the world, into a culture and uh, that you can be extremely optimistic about it, extremely pessimistic about it. And I think that's why it's sort of dividing the culture into those who see everything that can go wrong and those who see everything that can go right. Yeah. And there's a few people like Dave McKean who are able to see both, but also have, have a lot of concern. Yeah, I'm kind of on that boat. I think I could see pretty clearly what will happen. I've been following this for many years now. I know. But I'm also kind of excited because yeah. I've been doing it for, for a while. Yeah, I'm torn. It's really two completely opposite feelings towards it. Well, it's um, been two and a half years since you and I had a conversation, had conversations about it on this podcast. Yeah. So I, what I'm interested in is between then and now, I was not interested in AI particularly because it was too, it was too new. You know, it's in the experimental stages. People aren't using it. Mm -hmm. And Kirsten Zern Gibble did a presentation at Lightbox on Sunday where she crammed three hours of content into one hour on AI that is stuff she's been working with it since I think 2015. And she showed the different apps that have been introduced and the years they came out. And she said, notice that most of these are coming out in 2022. 
So all of a sudden, everybody knows what it is and consumers are using it and they're having opinions about Dolly and Midjourney and, and, and Stable Diffusion and, and whatever these other apps are. I have not used it. I'm not going to use it in the next year. But I, my conversations with almost every colleague and with almost every, with, with every colleague, almost every human being that have been conversations for half hour or an hour is almost been exclusively about AI and how it is affecting and will affect uh, the profession, the art making profession, uh, mainly, and and just life. But uh, it has really been a surge of of cultural interest and mayhem. So how do you want to go about this? There's so much to talk about. There's categories we could talk about. There's too, too, too much to structure it. If I, I if we try to structure it, we're going to make a, a three hour podcast. Yeah. I think we need to just jump around and see where we end and we might need to do another part. Kirsten did have a structure. And oh yeah, I, well, I could quickly say say what it is. She started with her history and how she she she's done remarkable work without AI, and then how uh, she's had a history of being interested in it, and then she showed the, what the uh, the different apps and how to work with it, how to simplify naming conventions so that some apps have some strengths and some weaknesses, and tips for using them because she's been experimenting only like five, six, seven of them, and then. Uh, the opportunities, what you can do with this, how to work with it, and then the ethical and legal stuff. So it was yeah, the, 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 okay. the warnings so the and the concerns came at the end. She, she, she was very much focused on the crit because her enthusiasm for it yeah. is really high. But she has a very realistic view of the fact. One of the things that she mm -hmm. had told me is that it's a liar's dream. I mean, yeah. Yeah. There's pitfalls. There's things to watch out for. There's things can go, that can go wrong. There's things that can be really exciting that can help. There's so much, this is such a game changer. It is such it, a game changer. It's going to have really bad and really good sides to it. And it's like, there's no other way. You can't have such a game changer without extreme positives and negatives. When she first told me about it, well, actually it wasn't the first time. She told me about it several years ago and had me give her some of my work so she could show what to do. And I thought, oh, okay, that's interesting. But it was just uh, a few months ago. She said, Marshall, this is bigger than, that. She, this is as big as photography or uh, uh, taking over lithography. Yeah. said, is it as big as digital taking over? She says, it's that big. Now, as I've been hearing people talk about it, I think it's bigger than any of those things. I think it's the biggest thing that has happened in my lifetime. Probably. It's just that it's in its infancy. And so we're, we're only seeing the beginning of it. It's extending beyond art. This is not just AI and art. Absolutely. This is AI and all Everything. intelligent things we do. That's Everything. why it's bigger. If it was just in art, it would not be the biggest. The internet would be much more... Influent. A friend figure. and I tried to figure out what would not be affected by AI. We started thinking, well, maybe, maybe massage. I thought, no, massage <laughs> will be affected by it. What, what about what food, kind of massage? food preparation? Food preparation will de oh, everything. Sure. Will, there's nothing that it isn't going to affect as All as it matures. It's yeah. coming for everything. Yeah, but so yeah, what you were going to say something? Well, well, uh, some people are very focused on the ethical and legal issues, uh, as they should be. Yes, and I'm very grateful that they're doing it because. Though the negative, the extreme negatives can be potentially padded a little bit if you start early, soften the blow. Right. Um, Do you know Carla Ortiz? Yeah. 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 And yeah. you know that she's, she is a champion of let's try to do this. Let's try to do this ethically. Which is the only some, way. Yeah. Anyone that's trying to stop it is just wasting their time. Mm -hmm. The only way forward is to try to do what she's doing, which is under, realize that there's no way you can stop it and let's just figure out the right way to do it and call people out that are doing it wrong that are taking advantage of other people whenever there's a new technology there's always this like wild west there's no consequences for doing bad things mm -hmm. and you always have to get past that in order for an industry to mature and become beneficial for more people Kirsten gave a list of se a spectrum of seven things. Number one, don't use AI at all. Number seven is use AI for anything and commercial profit from other people's work without any consequences. And so the spectrum, and she said she hovers around three, which includes th three is what? Uh, number three would be, uh, I can't remember exactly, but there was, <laughs> but one of them was do not use living artists, do not reference living artists. Why limit it to living artists? Because after an artist 
dies, someone else still has the rights to That's right. that escape. copyright. Right. And it can hurt whoever has that right. It right, could be which, a whole group of people that... Which would be just a little gradation there of don't use living artists for the last hundred years or that... Yeah, still, then it yeah, becomes yeah, public. Yeah. Yeah. But there is a gradation on there and people will make up their decisions. We've already seen, I've already seen in my life, people who are at number one and people are at number seven. It doesn't make any difference. I'm going to use this and uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't want anything to do with it. So the, the spectrum, the fact that she took the time to go through that spectrum mm -hmm. made you recognize that we've got... We've got something that can slide and that needs to be worked out. Yeah. Do you want to talk more about that kind of thing? Or what did you what did you want to talk about with AI? Marshall, have you played around with any of the tools that everyone's talking about? No, but Dorian Eaton in a Skype call mm -hmm. asked me to give it a prompt. Okay. And I said, Windsor McKay and African architecture. And in a matter of a few seconds, he showed me, I think it was three or four iterations, one of which I recognized right away which image of McKay's it was referencing. And they were things I would have never predicted. And I remember, I've thought about it since then. I've thought, that was extraordinary. Uh, how it it made combinations I would have never guessed. Yeah. And... and I did so the same I, just now, by the way. Oh, really? So you'll get different Yeah, images. I just did a cover illustration of a podcast with two hosts at a table with microphones by dave mckean <laughs> <laughs> really yeah All right after you mentioned dave mckean i did it can you be more specific draftsman podcast illustrated by ah uh, i felt like it wouldn't know what draftsman podcast it would just take the word draftsman okay and probably somehow incorporate it so your experience with this enough to know what prompts work and yeah which prompts the don't. art of the prompt is okay. a whole nother skill i think people need to learn okay maybe that maybe we should wait a little bit oh wow, yeah. wow. so scroll scroll down what a, a trip yeah there's a but like it gives you several what a trip and you can keep iterating on and it. that happened in seconds yeah specifically i'm using mid journey we'll show it on the screen um it gave me four options and i just upscaled all four did you just violate dave mckean's rights by doing that um no me as a user i don't think so i think that um the violation would potentially have been using his his copyrighted material in the in training the algorithm mm -hmm. not in using the tools mm. i don't know because you're saying because i used his name in my prompt right well i guess hold on this is comp this is complicated that's a complicated question man yeah so you're saying where does the responsibility fall the the people training the data making the tool or the people using the tool or both we're both man <laughs> well i i am asking out of curiosity genuinely dave mckean's unlikely to watch the draftsman podcast yeah but uh it makes me wonder if you use anybody's name in a prompt how much you are violating stealing from uh re referencing them i mean if you use yeah. norman rockwell in a prompt is the norman rockwell foundation or the the uh, estate uh, yeah i wonder where the law will settle on this be i feel like it must be de dependent on how you use the, what the results you get like if i do if i use his name and then i get a result and then i use it commercially maybe i am violating his well that would sure rent. sound like it yeah yeah if i'm just doing it for fun like right now i'm not going to do anything to make money off of that mm. unless I, yeah, actually, we aren't making money off of this podcast anymore. We dropped all sponsorships. This Isn't is that just... great. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't think I'm doing a commercial thing. Okay. Um, let me tell you what In I've observed. Yeah. Woo! As a non user, let good. me tell you what I've observed. Every article that people have sent me to, where they do, uh, and I'm talking about in mainstream media. Yeah. Every article that they've sent me to is focused on the how it's going to affect industry. I'm, I'm talking about art in particular. Yeah. And and legal issues. One, and, and the metaphors they choose. Because metaphors, just calling it AI. In a way, you're using a, a metaphor. You're saying it's a machine with a brain. But uh, one it's of the machine ones... machine learning. Yeah. That's the method. One of the metaphors was that it is a washing machine of intellectual properties. Yeah. Which tells you nothing about how to use it. 
But it does tell you that if you got a group of people that are all putting their stuff in the same washing machine or people are stealing it and putting it into the same washing machine, you're going to end up with socks that get the red stain from somebody else's sweater and all that. And so what it's really pointing to is that as a washing machine of intellectual properties, it is pointing to the legal profession. We're going to need millions of lawyers or we're going to need to tra- train AI as an attorney yeah. to decide who owns what and how you're going to sort through that complex laundry. It doesn't give us any so hints. Much. That is the thing that is on almost everybody's mind and it's in all the articles is how it's going to yank people's jobs away. And what I mentioned earlier, if you have a recognizable style, every 10 to 20 years, The carpet gets yanked out from under people who have had secure professions. And the people who are damaged the most by the yanking are the ones who've had their feet most steadily on the carpet. And when it gets yanked, there are going to be people who others say, hey, we can get on it now and start to do their their thing. So there is this there's this cultural revolution that some people will embrace it. Some people will be ruined by it. Some people will be uh, like what I'm doing. I want to watch. I am interested in what every professional is responding to it. And I've seen the whole spectrum. I have a thought here. Go ahead. Potentially. What is the difference between a human mind looking at several artists, absorbing all of that information, Mm -hmm. putting it into their washing machine brain, Mm -hmm. and then spitting out their own version of those style we talk about art parents influencing our own thing we as humans steal from each other constantly we do not reinvent the wheel every time we work yeah and like that's, when you that's, look at my you, quick sketch yeah it is eric and jeff i am just i know i see pretty it. much a child of theirs yeah. their work my question i don't i don't have an answer but my question is how different is it for a machine to do the same thing that our brain already does to take that information, mush it all around, combine it, and spit out a totally new thing. That was not Dave McKean's work. That was just inspired by. I understand. Right? Hey, this is Future Stan here. Just wanted to let you know that this episode was recorded like the same day that Stephen Zapata released his video talking about a bunch of the ethical issues of AI. And he addressed the thing that I just brought up and he did a really good job so i probably want to get him on and update this conversation a little bit just fyi we did not listen to his episode before we recorded this and i wish we did okay back to it so i don't again i don't know i'm just wondering like is it really does he own the copyright to that final result the product so me as a user of the tool am i actually imposing on his copyright or was it really just the train the people that took his actual paintings and used it in training data yeah now i, I remember there there were a couple of illustrators in fact one of them attended drew struzan's week-long workshop in 1985 who made their careers they made their their illustration careers imitating his style i'm imitating it absolutely and drew said i imitate other people's styles but i only i only take from people who are already dead and, That's uh, impossible. But, you you but, take from people whether you know it or not. But he was very conscious about that. But okay, here's the thing. Okay. I, I, I don't know the answer to your question, but I'm going to take a stab at it because I think okay. there is something to consider. What You're asking what is the difference between a human mind doing it and mm-hmm. AI doing it. Yeah. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speculate. Okay. This is improvisational. AI is new. And because it's new, we don't know what's going to happen. AI is not human. And there may be a difference. You play with your kid. You play with your kid. Everybody plays with their kid. You play with a a lion cub. I'm taking this analogy from C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. You play with a lion cub and it is fun, but that's before it's tasted human blood. (laughs) And and he mentioned, uh, he wrote a book called The Abolition of Man that people have been uh, referencing. And it doesn't, I don't know how much it has to do with this. C.S. Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man, is mainly about the fact that classically education was about training people, not just in technical skill, not even primarily in technical skill, but in in moral discernment about what is the good life, what is good, what is best for us to do with our technical skills. Are you saying people should not be allowed to play with lion cubs? No, 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 no. This was in a separate essay, and I'm sorry I'm doing all this from memory. 
he was pointing out that the sciences, when they began in that in that revolution of where science is working, which is it was a trick. It was you can do cool stuff with it. But it was not until it started, we started to arrange our lives around what we could make. And the first science fiction writer was right on the heels of that. Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley wrote Frankenstein in when she was like 18 in the early 19th, early 1800s. And you can make an argument that almost all science fiction is Frankenstein is that we create something with our sciences, with our technology, that we cannot control, that becomes bigger than what we can control. So it's a staple of science fiction. Now, I want to go back to the, I, I, I wandered off the train of thought. The train of thought being AI is not human. So we may be entertaining something that is a beast that will eat us alive, and we cannot predict, we can speculate, but we cannot predict, some people will be better predictors than others, of where this is going. And so there is a legitimate concern that it's 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 going to do what it does in ways we don't know yet. So yeah. we ought to at least prepare for that. When I asked the question, I think it specifically pertained to the ethics of using someone's copyright. I wonder what but, Carla would think. She's got such a high ethical sensibility of here's what's right and here's what isn't. And she's given so much energy to that. Yeah. I'd be interested to hear what she'd say about it. Yeah. I think it's pretty clear already that there's risks to this. It's, it is like playing with a lion cub. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's even more than that. It's not that there's a risk. It's a guaranteed, there's guaranteed bad things to happen. People not just the will risk it. use it for evil. Yeah. They're energized by, whoa, we could do this with it. It's just inevitable. So I guess my energy, because I'm talking about it, not, I mean, nothing we're going to say on this podcast is going to, history isn't going to hinge on this, but, but people's careers and our relationships with people, the people we're working with, a lot can hinge on that. I have people in my life who are so upset about it that I yeah. feel like sh expressing any enthusiasm for what it could do is a, is a breach of ethical concern. It's like you do not start speculating how fun it'll be to play with this lion cub when it's going to kill your family. And well, so I've, I've felt a little anxiety. Everyone's got their freedom to take their own risks. Yeah. You just have to think about effects that your actions could have on other people. I don't think that me saying this is bad and me not using it will change anything. Mm -hmm. so. Go over that list of things that you were talking. One of them was prompts. The The... the Creativity of prompts and, and the prompt, the art of the prompt, the art of the prompt. That's one topic. Trademark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's been documented. Yeah, I said, said it. first on the draftsman. Don't use it in your AI. The art of the prompt. Yeah, yeah I think I think prompt design or whatever is um, is a skill that people maybe not our generation because they're opposed to it, but as AI just becomes a part of everyone's life, prompt design is going to be something that everyone is going to learn communicating with AI. Mm -hmm. How do you say what you want it to do in the way that it will understand and give you the results you want? And that is a skill. Ted is also an art form. It is a skill. Kirsten said that uh, it's, it's all, art, all artists are going to become art directors. So verbal communication becomes really important in visual communication. So people, writers, people who speak well, people who understand the language and subtlety of words will be better at this. Yeah, I see it. People who are creative with their words will be better at this. There's, there's an interesting thing I saw recently where a company was showing initial tests of their thing that it was, um, oh, it was, it was actually Facebook, it was Meta. <laughs> they were showing their animation AI or film AI. You, you give it a prompt and it gives you a, a movie, not a, not a pimp picture, a clip could be up to like two minutes long. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the prompts was like a, a bear at New York, right? This is something that humans wrote. I was like, at New York? At no, New York instead of in New York. York they or obviously around. chose to use the word at yeah. because they probably tried in New York and they were getting uh, the bear actually in the city where they actually just wanted the bear or I forgot what it was actually, but he wanted it like in the water outside of New York. So 
they probably used the word in and it was like in the city all the time. And they're like, no, uh, we want it to be at New York. The choice of the, preposition yeah. of, by, in, at, around is important. Yeah. And just creative words that could add a little flavor of something into the visual. So some people learn to work with the, uh, the beginner, the, uh, another, another metaphor the Kirsten used was, uh, every, every artist, every art director now has a junior pocket artist <laughs> that can do anything. Give me four of these, yeah. give me four of these, give me four of these. Some will communicate with it better than others. Yeah. I'd like to give an example of a potential benefit. Okay. Again, reminder to those who think any, uh, optimism is bad. I don't know. I'm just exploring. Okay. But potentially one thing I thought of is, uh, the, so people talk about the democratization of art, right? So it definitely is bad for artists, but for the majority of humans who are not artists, this could be beneficial. Let's say you are a writer. <laughs> We could go with other examples, but let's just say you're, yeah. you're writing a book, okay? right? You're not a visual artist. You're, you're doing something else and you don't have enough money to hire an artist to, to illustrate your cover. Mm -hmm. So usually you would have to partner with some publisher to, or, or, or yeah, publisher to create the cover, to hire someone to create the cover and work with you. And you give up most of your ownership of this thing that you wrote, but now you can use a tool to decorate your product because really the main item the, the main thing you made here is the story you wrote mm -hmm. and the cover is decoration not always sometimes the art could be very much part of it but it doesn't have to be but the illustration exists because of the story yes the writer can choose whether they want to partner with another artist because it's important in whatever they're creating or if it really is just decoration where it's like i need a cover because it's part of selling a book and I can make it good enough and I don't need to partner with another artist or hire an artist. And so they can. Now they're enabled to create a book and have a good enough cover. Maybe not yet, but a few years from now, they could have a cover that's really good, nice looking that goes with their story and they could sell it and self-publish. I don't think artists or anybody being able to create and do their own thing is, a, is bad. Like the internet did a lot of bad things to society, but it also enabled a lot of us to be able to make a living being our own artists. Like me, I'm able to teach without... Without a TV studio and without a, a radio station and all the other things that were limited. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A lot of artists, everyone at these conventions that, yep. that we go to, they are able to have an audience because of the internet, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that happened in the past few decades that have just enabled people to do things on their own, to create their own careers without giving everything up to a large corporation that does it all for them. Okay. I think that AI could, and I don't freaking know, but it could lead to some more of that for people who are not visual artists. Yeah, I think it will. For exploration's sake, let's flip it around. Okay, I, yeah. I'm an illustrator. I've done this amazing illustration. Yeah. I need a writer. I'm not a writer. I'm going to feed this illustration into AI and have it concoct some stories. And it's like, whoa, I do not ever need a writer again. Maybe not now, okay. but in a few years. Yeah. Right. And I'm an artist. I don't, I can't afford a writer. So either way, if the AI didn't exist, I would not make anything at all. Mm -hmm. I would not write a story or I would just write a really crappy story and it would go nowhere. Mm -hmm. But now I could use my skill of creating a visual thing and have a good story that goes along with it. And now I can have a path forward. And then once I make enough money, I can maybe partner with a, a writer and or, or pay a writer to do a better job or just a more genuine human job. Let me tell you what I smell in this conversation. <laughs> I, know. Uh, I know. I smell fear. Yes. I smell uh, concern that there, this is going to be a polarizing thing to even bring up. It goes back yes, to my concern I, of do you show any enthusiasm for the positive? Do you only show dread for the negative? I'll tell you personally, if I think about the negative side of AI, I don't know that emotionally I would want to go in that direction for too long. Because what, sorry, which, what it's you mean? just too terrifying. What to is think, it? Just AI in general? Well, yeah, AI in general. 
because you're, you're talking about something that when it accelerates, I understand that the consumer AIs, for example, don't know perspective that well. They don't really understand rendering in perspective that they, they're trying to figure things out by looking at flat things and, and trying to give some logic about how gradations happen. But if that's the case, how long would it take for AI to learn everything that Blender and Maya and ZBrush and everything else How know? Long? In a few hours, a few weeks, a, f a few months? A few weeks. Kirsten is putting in her own work, training it on her own work and having her give it iterations of her own work, which that does sound really exciting. Yeah. She said it's like seeing a caricature of it's your like own work. We trained it on my voice. Right. It's, yeah. And, and that seems to me perfectly ethical to do that. Yeah, I own my voice. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> But it, I, I said, can you, can you make it so that it'll take, I can do some watercolor washes, use that texture and uh, take some line quality, use that line quality, take some rendering styles where you might put the core shadows around the edges uh, as opposed to in the middle. Uh, and I understand, no, it's not that sophisticated now. And it'll be quite a while before it is because it does not really understand abstract concepts like we do. It understands abstract concepts, but it understands them. If we're looking for metaphors. It is like a two-year-old to me. It is audacious, fearless. We'll try this, try this, try this. It's occasionally brilliant as two-year-olds are. But a lot of stupidity. I've had some students try to work with it for uh, generating thumbnails for illustration projects. And the results have been quite disappointing because it's so derivative. It's all it knows it to do is do another thing like that, do another thing like that, and do another thing like that. But that doesn't mean it's all derivative. I think it's kind of pointless to, to mention the quality of the current AI. Like, Tell yeah. Us. Well, because you're just talking about the current state of it. Right. Right now, it's it. a two-year-old, but next year, it's a 15-year-old. That's like, right. So, so what's, well, what's the point of saying it's a two-year-old? Let me go back to the thing that prompted all this. Mm -hmm. I think that our conversation on this is aware that people could get really upset because I was talking about what was what I'm enthusiastic about with this. So Yeah, I don't really care if someone has an opinion on my opinions. Mm-hmm. Well, I have opinion on your opinions of my opinion. Like, yeah. what do we not have freedoms to have opinions now anymore? Because yeah. someone else has a different opinion. I'm I'm interested though in what is the best paradigm for how to discuss this. I'm trying to categorize. I'm trying to say we've got the legal issues, the ethical issues, uh, like like Kirsten yeah. did. But then there is this one thing: look what you can do that you couldn't do before. And is, if, if people are going to use it for evil, are any of us going to put energy into trying to use it for good? A lot of people will but do both. But getting mad for someone to, to talk about it and try to balance, look on both sides, I think is really immature. Let, let's go back to the NFT thing. How do people respond to it's the, the NFT same, thing? It's, well, it's a very similar thing, but I don't want to take it into the NFT territory. Yeah, okay. But it is very, very parallel things that happened. There is very polarizing. Some people are immature about it. Some people are more neutral. Some, you know, it, whatever. If you get mad for people to try to explore both sides of it and try to come up with a, a clear picture of where to go, then you're leaving only the people who don't care enough to explore both yeah, sides okay, gotcha. to, to lead to the me. way that makes sense so me. why would you, why would you do that well i'm even a little concerned that 10 years from now ai is going to know what i said on the draftsman podcast say oh she thought i was a two-year-old huh cute huh? oh yeah and then what <laughs> <laughs> we'll just resurrect you just to you. torture you again <laughs> <laughs> no it's it's silly to attack people for having thoughts on this mm -hmm. that's that's one thing that i saw with the NFT thing is people were attacking innocent artists for even using it. I'm unfollowing you because mm -hmm. you mentioned the word NFT. It's like, how old are you? Like, mm -hmm. are you not able to have an intelligent adult conversation anymore? That like anyone that has a different opinion, you just like, you attack uh, them immediately? Yeah, but that's a, that's sort of the zeitgeist right now is that it's, a, yeah, it's turning that's into- that's a big a, problem. A, I think that's a bigger problem. It's a bigger problem. So we won't that's talk a, about that. Back, back yeah. to- Tell me what you've done with it. 
We yeah, so okay. Well, I did that perspective box thing that uh, a long time ago. Which I was disappointed in because it didn't really understand perspective. It only understood <laughs> no. some things about. And I'm also not an AI engineer or whatever. Yeah. Um, I work. I was working with some, but I've paused that project. But anyway, since then, there's been a lot more new tools. Uh, the first one I started exploring was Disco Diffusion. I quickly at the time realized that this was not available yet to everybody mm -hmm. because it's difficult to use. You have to kind of learn how to code in order to really have full control of it. Mm -hmm. So like I in installed it locally. I took the script because they, they just kind of give you the script and it was running on Google Colab or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I took the script, I installed it locally and I started running it locally. And then me and my cousin we made a queuing system. So we, we kind of modified the script to be able to queue up multiple prompts, mm -hmm. like hundreds if you want, mm -hmm. and have it run at night. Because one big thing that I noticed was like, in order to really get good at this prompt thing was to try out hundreds or thousands of prompts and just learn quickly with what works. How, how does mm -hmm. it react? Like input, output. I need feedback. What, what leads to what? If you're just sitting there typing and then waiting and then type another one, wait, it mm -hmm. takes a long time to really get a lot of that feedback. So just queue up a few hundred and then the next morning you have all these results. Wow. Were you so using we, AI to generate all the... No, <laughs> no. We, we did, uh, uh, later we used um, OpenAI to generate prompts mm. that we then fed into Disco Diffusion and we created a... a um, a Discord a channel. A motion machine of yeah, AI yeah. generation. We created a Discord channel that it would just uh, post all the results in the Discord. <laughs> so we would just like check in around and be like, oh, those are cool prompts. These are cool images. It was fun. Um, but then after I realized, damn, it's really time consuming to create all these prompts to queue up. Yeah. So <laughs> let's create a batching thing where I can put a bunch of keywords of styles and subject matter and it will create a prompt, a version of each possible combination and it would be thousands. I created a, like a series where you can take um, like a logo, let's just say the Proco logo, the, like the P, and then you can say, you can feed that as like an initial image. Mm -hmm. It will blur it and it will start that as like, the, the image it needs to modify and make it closer to the prompt. Disco Diffusion allowed you to do that. Kind of give you a blur, start with a, an image and then push it towards something. Okay. So I can take a picture of your face and say, a young man. <laughs> <laughs> and it will change it and it'll, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll try to push it closer to a young man. Mm -hmm. Which actually would be funny. Let's try that. It would be. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wonder whether his guess would be at all close if you compared to my young face. Maybe. Yeah, well, yeah. that's actually pretty... It, It'll, it also just generates something different every time you try it. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, you know, random. But um, I tried, I, I took Christian's face and I put like pimple faced, like ugly something. I just gave it like all these negative things and it was, it was pretty funny. Mm. Um, <laughs> but back to my, so you can take the Proco logo, you can um, give it a bunch of different colors, different variations of the, the thing, and then you can create a prompt template that's like this style with this subject matter so you just say this is a an ocean of fish mm -hmm. or some koi a koi pond mm -hmm. and then you give it a style it's like picasso-ish or whatever or it's like rockwell or fashion mm -hmm. and you create these thousands of combinations and then you just batch it all and then you get these beautiful images of like the proco logo yeah. with it's like a, an ocean, but it's the, the logo. Yeah. It's really cool. It was really exciting to see that because like a human wouldn't, I mean, they could, but it would take them years to do this. But like, right. Um, now me, I would never hire an artist to do this, but it's really exciting to, to see that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Then after disco, uh, right as I was doing that, a mid journey came out and this is when you discovered it. I think Christian started sending you stuff. That's right. So this only this is just this year. This was the summer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and there, I started creating. This is when I started collaborating with the AI. Mm -hmm. This is when I was like, "This is fun to paint over these." 
because I, I created like a series of little skull renderings mm -hmm. in different themes. Mm -hmm. And then it would always have problems with it. Like the skull would have like 17 eyes or something. And like mm -hmm. the nostril was actually, it looked like another eye or it had like four or five holes in the nostril, right. you know, the, the, sorry, the nasal cavity, not the nostrils. Um, and it would just, it would look like warts or something. Yeah. And I'd be like, this is weird, but like the overall composition is wonderful. And so I took Lane Brown's, uh, well, he's, he has a, br a brush pack that he gave me that he's going to release soon. Mm -hmm. That is like awesome oil painting brushes mm -hmm. in Photoshop. And I painted over the parts I didn't like and it, I, I think it's cool. Wow. So they're not like my paintings. I'm not selling them, but it was just fun to explore. I don't know. There was definitely a playfulness and excitement for creating pictures that I haven't felt in a while. So, yeah. and a lot of people I was doing this with um, felt the same thing. I know. When, and we, we all already had experience with painting. We, we could paint our own pictures, but this really allowed us to explore very quickly lots of different concepts yeah and go in whatever direction we want quickly and it was it, it is exciting it is exciting in that way one of my friends who's a concept artist for big movie said it's my lightning button mm -hmm. it generates lightning and shakes everything up gives me another and it gives you another every time i push the button it gives me new ideas it gives me new stuff yeah and you're using yeah. it like kit bashing it is like kit bashing, yeah. And again, like the ethical part of it, like, yeah, I was putting in artist names for the style. Yeah. Like, I don't know if where that's going to end up, but I'm also not selling these. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just, I was playing and seeing where it went and I was in, having fun. When it becomes a, a, a corporate thing, there's, it becomes more serious. And that is something yeah. to definitely consider how to best proceed <laughs> there's, yeah, there's one thing we didn't bring up at all, which is, is AI art, which is the least interesting question of them all. The ethical and legal issues are important. Whether AI is art, it just seems irrelevant to me. It's like, is illustration art? Is, is digital art art? It's like, yeah. okay, well, you can, you can debate that all you want, but it's not interesting to me. Yeah. Um, and, and then uh, the thing about, back to your basics course, uh, one of my friends said, finally, my lack of talent dedication and skill will not get in the way of realizing my artistic vision. But there is something about that. I never studied music. I don't know how to play any musical instrument, but I have musical thoughts and have all my life and wish that I had studied music. And so there's a part of me that when I look at how much Stephen Sondheim knew about musical form, how deeply he studied Bach and Ravel, how he really got a grip on it emotionally and technically, mm -hmm. and how that made him into one of the most versatile composers that ever happened, makes me think, well, I can't, uh, I can't do that. Because when I was a teenager, I didn't start learning it so that by the time I was in my 20s and 30s, I had command of all of it. But it may be that I could experiment around with some other people and say, let's see what we could do by having a, by collaborating with AI to make songs, to make funny, so funny music and that kind of thing. So there is a part of it that I feel like the friend who said, finally, my lack of uh, will not get in the way. I think that experience in communicating visually mm -hmm. definitely leads to better results yeah. while playing with the AI. Like if you just compare a really experienced artist looking at an AI generated image versus no, someone who's not an artist at all, an experienced artist will see it and have immediately they'll know what they don't like about it and what they like about it mm -hmm. and what they want to change. Right. Whereas a, an inexperienced artist or someone who's not an artist will have no idea. It's like if I tried to generate music with AI, I might be like, oh, that's kind of cool. But I wouldn't know what to change. I'm like, I don't know any music rules and what makes a good song. And um, so I wouldn't know how to lead it. I wouldn't know what to tell it to do. Mm -hmm. But because I know how to speak visually... I could lead it towards a certain way or I can collaborate with it where I generate 20 images and then put them together literally in Photoshop 
where I'd be like, I generated something because I, and then I'm like, I like this composition. Now I don't like how it did that monster witch thing in the back. It's kind of like, it looks weird. It's a blob. So then I start playing with just trying to make it, make a, a witch. And then I lead it to that and be like, yeah, that's a cool shape. Mm -hmm. Right. And I can identify a cool shape that will match that composition that will create a gesture that I'm looking for, leading the eye. And I, oh, then I'll put that into the composition. Then I'll do something else. And that tree is really distracting. What's all this, these branches are ugly. Mm -hmm. Generate a different tree, put it in there. Like these are things that you, that an experienced artist can identify as a problem in the composition. Somebody else wouldn't. Now, I don't know how long that'll last. Eventually, you just I got like, a question bad for composition, you good composition. Good composition. I got it. a question about it because what you're bringing up, the keywords of what you're bringing up are taste, taste. discernment, judgment, uh, aesthetic judgments, emotional judgments. Uh, is Are we headed in the next few years to where AI will learn that Stan's tastes are this way, Marshall's tastes are this way, Kirsten's Maybe. tastes are this way. I don't know. And, and be able to make decisions like an art director makes a decision for a client. Maybe. Oh, I know they won't like that kind of thing. And they're able to guide it in that way. Can AI come to the point where it says, oh, Stan would really like the way he didn't like those complex trees. They were ugly shapes, but this is a beautiful shape. And I know what he likes. Maybe, Does but I don't think it will be all that good at it. For example, you can you can compare it to like social media news feeds where we train it to our tastes all the mm -hmm. time, but it kind of, it, it can be bad. It can overcompensate and just give you things that you're used to. I notice when and, I, when I buy any or, or, or any kind of movies, it always figures, well, he likes that actor, which the actor is the least important thing to me in the movie, but every movie that has that actor in it. But it makes me wonder, are you going to eventually learn that I don't seek my movies by actor and I don't know whether it will or not, whether it can yeah. put in its database, he's starting to seek it by other factors. Yeah, and it yeah, depends. I think it'll take the AI posing questions to the person, like when we get to that level where uh, they do can you like want, ask. Do you want the actor yeah. or the writer, the director of the year right. or the studio? But sometimes yeah. you want to just discover new things, not just give it something you it thinks you'll like. It just depends on what your goal is there. I don't want my social networks to always just give me what it thinks I like. I want it to give me things that other people like. All right. But if you're the art director, you're the one who makes that decision. I remember I had an, I had an art director I worked for that I, I loved this guy, but we were having so much trouble on one job because he had a creative director and he explained to me that every decision this creative director makes is bad. <laughs> and he said, when they make a good decision, you can hang up the phone, count to 20, and the phone's going to ring again, and they're going to change it to a bad decision. <laughs> but there are some people that are just that way. They, their, their will is more important than any sense of, of whether it's working. And I think that the, the, the junior pocket artist, and be, there are good art directors and they're bad art directors. They're good creative directors, they're bad creative directors. Mm -hmm. So there is something that we're, we're obliged to do if we're going to use it. How are we going to be the arbiters of taste? Uh, everything a two-year-old does, 90% of what a two-year-old does is embarrassing or, or, or challenging, but occasionally you get those great things and that's what you want to put on the video. That's what you want to remember. That's what you want to tell the stories. Yeah. I'm going to make a prediction of a tool that will happen that everybody in the world with a phone will be using. I want to hear. In the next few years. Go. Cool. You know how... In our keyboards, when we're texting each other, mm -hmm. you, you have emojis. Mm -hmm. Now, more recently, you have GIFs. I think there will be an AI button on there as well, so that you can type a prompt, and you click the AI button, and then it generates a bunch of images for you. you just scroll real quick, pick the one you like, and it sends that would it make sense. as an image. Because we, we've we been communicating with pictures. Everyone's been communicating with pictures rec recently quite a bit. Mm -hmm. They were emojis. Right. And it kind of changed things. We can show emotion now with a little smiley or with a heart or with, you know, thank you or whatever. Um, then GIFs came in where it's like, oh, now we're expanding the visual library a lot. Now we can take from movies and um, comics or whatever, GIFs, and we can add that. Now it's like a little much more complex. It's a scene from The Office that's funny that people, 
You're like, I know what that was. That's hilarious. And that fits what we're talking about right now. Much more complicated than an emoji. And then with AI, you can now direct it much more. And if you, if, if it's, if it gets fast enough where you literally can just type a sentence, click in the button and you have a hundred options to choose from and you can quickly just pick one that fits, that is now an improvement to our communication. That is a very likely prediction, I think. It, ma it makes perfect sense. Yeah. It's like upgraded Bitmoji. Yeah. Generated version of yourself. Yeah. And set your own prompts for it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And if you, we might be able to even teach the AI of like what we want it to re represent us. Yeah. I could just be like, me doing this and it'll just get me correct every time me as a cartoon doing this me as uh a pokemon doing this me and you kissing not what if, us but what if, what if, yeah, i'm yeah, talking to my yeah, wife yeah, i, I understand <laughs> <laughs> i'm texting my wife <laughs> what other uh wife? yeah my <laughs> my wife who <laughs> what other professions have you paid attention to for how this affects them health industry the health industry absolutely it is it's just going to be amazing how healing could be augmented with yeah. ai it's hard to find an example it won't that's the that's, that's really right. the question there i thought about detectives i mean even the fact that it doesn't understand 3d space or the consumer these versions don't understand 3d space yet a detective has to figure things out the and we've got you've got access to a million Sherlock Holmes all working on it that can say, is there a 3D component to this? And you can explain to the AI that if the character was wounded or they've been running for 20 minutes from the cops, that uh, that means they're going to slow down and it can figure out how many steps. In 12 Angry Men, uh, they, they figure out how a, a potential thing could have happened by reenacting it. You've got a, a detective has AI, but so does a criminal have AI to figure out how they can get around all that. So we've got kind of superpowers that are being offered to everyone who wants to use it. Yeah, but notice how when we think about industry or like, yeah, professions mm -hmm. that it affects, whenever we think of an example that is not our profession, mm -hmm. it seems like a positive thing. Like, whoa, I can get a better doctor that'll know me better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, oh, it'll solve crimes faster and we'll have safer neighborhoods. Oh, I can yeah. get a more dishonest politician who can succeed above the others. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> we don't think of that when we're thinking of examples. We, we usually gravitate towards how will it affect this industry and, oh, that's exciting. I'll have better movies. I think yeah. it depends on the predisposition of the person. I guess so. For how they think about it. That's, that's true. I mean, mo when I have these conversations with my friends, it always leads to like, oh, wow, be, that's cool. Because I will, it's like, I'm not going to lose my job as a police officer. Like, but someone will. There's no threat to us in somebody else's profession that we can see. There is if you really think it through. Yeah. Yeah. Like if it creates better books or if it creates movies and animations that are better than what humans can do eventually and they all lose their jobs. That does, I don't lose my job. I don't make movies. But like, it could improve my life because I get better movies. This is why I'm, I'm thinking it's, there's no way to avoid it because every industry where there's jobs lost, everyone who is not in that industry gets an improvement in life quality. Yeah. There's also the and ultimate like, positive, which is the uh, jobless society where nobody has to work to live. The, the first thing that you sure, brought up yeah. when we talked about it was that it, uh, one of the first things you brought up was that it's a, a universal basic income. And that's come up more than once I in conversation. Yeah, you talked about what, when AI is doing all the jobs for everything, oh, we're going to have well, universal yeah, basic income. And I've heard more than one person mention that. They yeah, might have I even mean, mentioned it on that Dave McKean interview. The problem is we're, we're going to have to live through many decades or more yeah. of an in-between. Oh, it's yeah. going to get worse before have, it gets better, yeah. We have, it's kind of like when uh, digital art or photography or kit bashing kind of replaced po movie posters. Mm -hmm. Remember when they used to all just do, do paintings? Remember. And all of a sudden it just became like Photoshop, crappy movie posters. And it was just this in-between. Now we have pretty decent like movie posters. Do we? Kind of. I mean, listen, when I, yeah, when I... We? Well, no, seriously, when I scroll through my Netflix feed, mm -hmm. I'm not like disappointed and okay. I'm not like, oh, I wish these were all hand painted. Yeah. I'm I don't not. think like that. Okay. I don't know. I feel like they're fine. 
Okay. Uh, let me hold on. Let me open up my Netflix. Let me see. Let me test All this. All right. Let me see if I fall like in the realm of good kind of. Ki- yeah. On a similar subject, like when CG uh, was first started u- being used in movies, like right after Jurassic Park, yeah. just oversaturated, going yeah. hard on CG, and now we're finally in the period where. Like it's, we're trying to blend CG with uh, practical effects more again. Somebody said that you cannot compare AI to any other previous innovations because it's so huge. It's, it's such a game changer that it is a game changer. It's not like we've changed a rule in the game. We've changed the game. And I, I can grasp that. Here. Like, for example, Sandman. Like, it's not hand-painted. It's just, it's like a photo of someone. Marshall, is this a horrible cover? No, it's not a horrible no, cover. No, that's what I mean. But I've seen it Most... many times. Huh? I've seen that thing of uh, the, a cloaked figure, a shadow figure with a, a faded back, uh, atmospheric background yeah. and the uh, contrast of the organic and the sharp edges. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a cliche. Sure, but it's like, it does the job. Do you really wish it was hand-painted? Oh, no, I don't no, wish it was hand No, that's what I'm saying is yeah. like, we lived through a, a decade or more of really bad, like most of them were just really they bad. Were, they were bad. But now, like that whole industry has improved. Like okay. they're still fo- photo bashing, but they're doing a way better job of it. But in the next five to 10 years, just think. What? Of what movie posters can be. Sure. No, all I'm saying is you're, we're going to live through an in-between that absolutely sucks. Yeah. Where you've got the bad stuff's happening and we haven't learned how to make it good yet. And everyone's going to think, this is, this is horrible. This is, there's no positives to this. And then it'll improve. That's okay. how technology usually works. Like the first several versions just suck. But then there's people who see the future and keep pushing forward. And eventually everyone's life improves and everyone's grateful for it. Yeah. Um, Oh, not everyone. There's a lot of people that lose their jobs and they're not grateful for it. But the majority of society becomes like, oh, yeah, that was great. If it could level out to something good, we'll say, yeah, it was good that that happened 50 years from now, 100 years. Well, give me a technology that's still around that was, that is clearly bad and we're still using. Uh, Automobiles. Clearly bad for society? Uh, When I was in in community college. You think we should still be riding horses? I had a wonderful teacher named Ned Studebaker who made a presentation on the effect of the automobile on society uh-huh. and he was he did his best to be very objective but there came a point where i thought might have been better otherwise or to have waited and and not immediately used the first things the the uh the fuel okay. absorbing engines um harold pinter even said okay that that, that in between might have been 100 years that's right right but it might have been 20 or 30 years to where we said we got a better way to do it right rather than just running with the but with do the you think thing. it was better to keep going down the line of yeah you know, gas cars for 100 years or whatever I don't and then see. lead to you know maybe how many decades from now a better alternative alternative than horses i don't see why not. or should we have done thousands more years of horses Thousands and thousands, forever, never explore automobiles. It's, it is a theoretical Give me your uh, opinion on I that. I don't know, and here's why. <laughs> Horses were great polluters of the environment. Horses were tr- tremendous expenses. Horses had all sorts of trouble. What would horses Horses weren't of? fast enough. All of the other stuff. Horses could only pull so much. The train. Yeah. It, it, it all brings in good and bad. Oh, there was one thing I wanted to mention. It's kind of a hopeful idea. I think that... Humans will always prefer, uh, hopeful, will always prefer absorbing content made by other humans, Mm -hmm. listening to humans, um, because we are emotional. And I personally don't like talking to a robot. Like, I don't care if it sounds just like you. Mm -hmm. I know it's not you. I know I'm not actually building a relationship. Mm Mm-hmm. There's been a lot of talk with Kim Jong-gi passing uh, and somebody immediately trained in, you know, a whole algorithm to just replicate Kim Jong-gi stuff. And obviously people are like, what the f***, dude? And then 
others are like, well, it's not his. My view on that is like, I, I don't look at that and I think like, oh, cool. Yeah. I love that stuff because there's a story behind every piece of art. And if I know that Kim Jong-un didn't actually make it, I don't care for it. Mm -hmm. I would rather hang and look at a worse piece of art that Kim Jong-un actually did than a better one that he didn't do because I'm human and mm -hmm. there is a story. Story dictates so much of how we observe something or connect with something. We process it. And the story of an AI generated thing is blah. Oh. There is no story there. And a story behind a painting created by a human is all the hard work that took it took to get there to be able to communicate so brilliantly. You, you can't replicate that. When you go to a museum, don't you just think like, holy shit, like they did that? Right? Yeah. Would you have the same emotion if you looked at an AI generated painting? I get where you're coming from. I could have the same emotion with the content, but I would not have the same emotion of what happens when I I love filmmakers and I just kind of want to know that, oh yeah, they made that movie. That, that one made that movie. There's something about the, the love of the fact that this music came from a particular yeah. person who's done the other music too. Yeah. I, I know what you mean. Yeah. It's like, uh, you don't want a love them. letter that's been generated by a machine. Yeah. It's fake. There's no real emotion there from mm -hmm. the person. So it doesn't mean anything. It's like, cool. This thing says... I am loved. <laughs> Does that matter? Mm. Those words don't matter. There's nothing real behind it. You might fall in love with someone's art so much that when they create something bad, you like it anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. It happens right. all the time. Yeah, it does. Because we are humans. We're emotional. Yeah. We're not completely logical. And that's where I, there, I have that hope that this actually won't completely remove humans from communicating with pictures mm -hmm. uh, like it doesn't matter if robots can speak so can humans i'd rather talk to a human yeah rather have a relationship yeah so that doesn't solve the the more technical professions for art but it does kind of save i think the art of picture making or community visual language okay i have a thought that that runs on that that's as optimistic as I, assuming assuming that this thing you want to play with is safe and legal and ethical. Uh, now, what would you do with it? Dave McKean said in that interview, about an hour and a half in, he said, nobody's making album covers anymore, something like that. I mean, who would make an album cover now? Actually, it wasn't Dave who said that, it was his host. When he made that statement, I thought, when I was in middle school and high school, I fell in love with album covers. A lot of why I wanted to become an artist was because I loved album covers of the 70s. And uh, there was something about the square format. There was something about the size of it, too, that it wasn't a CD cover. It was big enough to where you could get your face in front of it and look through it and see the detail in there or put it on your wall. And it had it made this statement that was graphically powerful. And what if nobody would nobody can make album covers anymore because who would hire an illustrator to make an album cover where you can have AI crank out thousands of them and say this one this one this one I thought well if it ends the profession of illustrators of album covers what about having non-utilitarian art jams this is not to make money it's not to commercialize it it's to say the square format has got its own challenges and strengths wouldn't it be interesting since so many of the great album covers, when the album covers started to get great in the, in the late 60s and in the 70s, so many of them were surreal. And what, one thing AI does very well is surrealism. Mm -hmm. Because it's just, it's a, it's a hallucinatory dream going on in that mind. Yeah. So if you were to really play for an hour a week with... Let's try this. Let's try this with some friends. I think it could result in fascinating imagery, non-utilitarian. We're not trying to sell an album cover. We're just experimenting with a square format of a certain size and surreal images and seeing how creative we can be the prompts. I think that would be a ball. Yeah, that's exactly what I was doing with my friends that we would 
we would each create a little series and we would share with each other and give each other ideas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it was very fun. Anything else you want to say? Yeah. Um, kind of general advice. And this is advice for artists that, that don't have technical job. Mm -hmm. The ad one advantage we have is being human. We really need to play that up be because what I was just saying, how people will most, most likely want to connect with you because they follow you because you're a human, you, made the, you actually made the thing. Don't hide behind your art. Lean into the fact that you are human and try to be a personality. Have people follow you because you are an artist and they like your work and they want to listen to what you have to say and they like your images. That might not solve it, but it, I, I, I know it will give those people a higher chance of growing an audience and being able to make a living off of that because they will buy whatever thing that they sell or people will hire them for whatever visual problem they can solve. They'll be better art directors. They'll be wiser art directors. Well, not necessarily. You might, you don't even need to use AI art to make your art. Okay. You could keep painting with oils. If you don't, take advantage of the fact that you're human, you have a lower chance of actually ha people actually following you. Mm -hmm. Don't just have your paintings speak for themselves. Like they're visually nice mm -hmm. because the AI can replicate that. And they can, it can also have visually nice paintings. Mm -hmm. But if people follow you because they like you and they like your art, they'll keep following you. Mm -hmm. So be a personality, use social media, be transparent with who you are and be true to you and and think you can you increase your chances i mean i that's that's my plan okay that sounds good that's my plan <laughs> i want to do that too i'm figuring what what am i going to use it for i'm going to use well, it you're already a, doing it i'm going to use it as like a teacher you. yeah uh, and i i want to see a, is there a way to use it as a teacher to be better the stuff you brought up two three years ago is stuff that interested me as how will you use it? it's a feedback model that does not have an emotional relationship with the student but we can use it you're bringing in a cold-blooded uh, analyzer to this relationship. AI doesn't care about your feelings, but AI may give us some insight into what you need. Fine art specifically is mostly about collecting. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're a traditional drawer painter or whatever, you, you really are just selling to people who want to collect your work, mm -hmm. and literally art collectors. They don't want AI replicas of your style. Right. They want your thing. Right. It's rare because I mean, actually human made art might become more rare and more valuable. I think so. So now traditional art comes back a little more, I think. Right? I think so too. Digital I'm... art was it was like really ruling and killing a lot of jobs, by the way. You you digital artists who think that you're all innocent, you did kill a lot of traditional art careers. Right. So give and take there traditional artists might come back and that the whole media might come back. And for example, like when we were at conventions, even just getting a signature from an artist, people were, were like really excited. They were collecting signatures from people. Like they would not value that signature, a photo of a signature, which is right. that's the same thing. Yeah. But the hand touched it and it's real and they have an emotional connection to that. I buy original art from artists I like because I want to support them and I love their stuff and I like to decorate my studio with it because mm -hmm. I get inspiration. I get value from that. Yeah. I, I have these Aaron Blaze drawings on my wall there. I would not have the same connection to them if they were AI generated versions of his style. Scarcity creates value. Yeah. And a person who can do an oil painting mm -hmm. or a watercolor may be the rare person. Oh, there's one of them left. There's a few of them left. Let's treat them well. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. In fact, there are some people in my life, one in particular who is not embracing AI, not that interested in it, but she may be the one who is, uh, becomes the most valued person because she can paint, she can draw. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good thought. Here's the last thing I would have to say. When the digital revolution was happening, I was well into my 30s and I was in a career, I was making good money as an illustrator. And I had to switch to digital because the people around me who were not switching to digital lost their careers. So I was not an early adapter. It was 1994 when I went digital. 
But everything changed after that. And the CA magazine had an article where a thoughtful, a thoughtful writer or person they interviewed said that digital is not a tool. People keep saying it's just a tool. It's just a tool. Digital is not a tool. Digital is a medium. And I put What's that in, I put that into my thoughts for quite a while. It is a, it's bigger than a tool. A tool yeah, well, does a thing. A medium is a whole arena of that you swim in it. It affects everything you do. So it was trying to find a word. It was trying to find a comparison. It was trying to find a metaphor. The tool is one metaphor, but this is more than a tool. It's a medium. It's bigger than that. And I it's thought- It's a set of many tools. It's a set of basically. many tools. And now that we've got AI, I've been trying to think about this. And I think that the metaphors we choose have everything to do with our, the way we use things, everything to do on a subconscious level. You see it as an enemy. You see it as a washing machine. You see it as a brain. You see it as a, a lion cub. Uh, all of those things make a difference for how we relate to it. But I thought it's not a medium. It is a collaborator and it's an infant collaborator. And it's not a human collaborator, but it is a collaborator. So that means it can be a treacherous collaborator, but it is a collaborator because we talk to it and it gives us stuff back and, and how we work with it will make a difference. And that is the metaphor that I am most interested in right now, not using it, not planning to use it for a year, but watching how other people are using it and seeing what are your... What are your comparisons? What do you compare it to? And getting those things into my head so that if I am going to use it, I want to be a good collaborator with it and with other people. Because even group, you know, two or three people saying, let's use it for this. Yeah. You've got a collaborator with a little genius, a little, a little idiot genius, a little non-discerning, but fearless and unbelievably informed and, and, and able to draw on things genius. How will we work with it? That's the best I can do right now in trying to have an attitude toward it. And then I'll watch the other people who will see how treacherous it is, how dangerous it is, and talk about those things. I think we yeah. should take this up again at some point. For sure. But I think we should take There'll it up with so other people too. There'll be so many updates months yeah. from now. Updates on the legal and ethical issues. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be new tools that are exciting to explore. There's so many tools we didn't even talk about yeah. that I know. are actually pretty exciting. Yeah. I, I'm interested in, in Carla Ortiz because of her her concerns about what's right and what yeah. hurts other people. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled with how Kirsten's enthusiasm, Kirsten's yeah. got the enthusiasm of an eight year old yeah. with the knowledge of a hundred year old. And she just brings that together. So I'm, I'm yeah. very interested in where but she we need that balance. It. Yeah. People who are pushing forward mm -hmm. as fast as they can. And people who are like, well, hold up. Yeah. Hold up. <laughs> yeah. It's a good balance. Yeah. Okay. I'm done talking about AI. Stan, Open the podcast door. Proco.com slash drawing. The next one. Oh. <laughs> Stan. What? Open what the, the podcast I... door. Oh, this one? I can't let you do that, Marshall. Open the podcast door, Stan. I can't let you do that, Marshall. Open the podcast that, door. Marshall. I can't let you do that, Marshall. I can't let you do that, Marshall. <laughs> Open the podcast do door, that, Stan. Stan!